Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Northern Spotlights talk show where we get to travel north with the Vancouver Aquarium. Joining me here today is Donna Gibbs. She is a Vancouver Aquarium diver and taxonomist, but that's not the only kinds of things Donna has done. Donna has led a long and, no, a short, wonderful, varied, young life <laughs> in which she's been able to go skydive, or yes, skydiving. She's been flying in planes. I think she's a pilot now. <laughs> Trying to be. She's on her way. And she also plays a mean cello, I hear. <laughs> she has done some pretty fantastic things, including even traveling up to the Arctic and being a librarian of sorts here at the Vancouver Aquarium for underwater marine life. That all sounds pretty exciting, Donna. Well, welcome here to, at the Vancouver Aquarium today. Uh, and we're speaking of you as being a diver, so I'm curious, Donna, how many dives have you logged? 2,400 in cold water. So majority of my dives have been in British Columbia. That 2,400 is a fair 2,400 dives underwater. All right. That's a fair amount of time <laughs> underwater, Donna. You haven't sprouted gills yet or anything? Not yet. Okay. All right. Uh, and I mentioned that you are a taxonomist. So she helps identify different kinds of marine life. She can just look at them and exactly know what she's looking at and put them in categories. Uh, that so that's a pretty impressive skill. And how did you get into being a taxonomist anyways? Well, um, I grew up, I was raised in an area where I was a long way from an ocean, but I did grow up uh, watching Sea Hunt. So I knew it was just a matter of time before I could do that. And when I finally did get to do it and I was in the ocean for the first time in my ocean dive, I was greeted by fish going, hello. It was just like you're one of them. And then there's all these wonderful, weird invertebrates, and I was completely hooked. So I joined the aquarium as a member, became a volunteer diver here, and the rest is history. I ended up working as a volunteer for a long time and then was hired by the fish research department. All right, that's pretty impressive. And your boss, Dr. Marliev, who does a lot of uh, fish research and, uh, well, just a lot of research, really, uh, he noted that, he told me especially, that you have a uh, background in design, actually, and he thought that that was really, really valuable for you being able to identify all these different animals, as she often sh bases them on groups of shapes and color. So... Uh, definitely in a, a very interesting way to get into taxonomy, I have to say. But IDing and cataloging these animals means that you have to dive down and find them. So you help support research by do, going on these different dives. Can mm -hmm. you walk us through what happens when you do a research dive? Certainly. Uh, we have a number of different projects that we work on uh, repetitively. It's, it's, um, we do look at cloud sponges and spot prawns and rockfish and lingcod. And so incidentally on all those dives while I'm doing that job, I have a slate with me and a light and a camera. And I take records of all the animals that I see while I'm swimming along and the numbers of them. And then when I come back, I have um, a computer program that I sit down and I enter all this data in, and I have some kind of an abundance. And over time, that information starts to mean a lot. So you can track the number of animals that you found, yes. where you found them, yes. what exactly they were. In fact, her coworkers also told me that they figure she's the only one in Canada that can ID all the different animals found along the bottom <laughs> of the seafloor. I work with some really great people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you also do some pretty impressive things. And uh, I, I've been diving myself, IDing all these different animals. That's certainly got to be a tough thing to do. But putting it all into a database seems like some really great opportunity for long-term monitoring of a number of different animals uh, and determining where they are. And you're managing this entire catalog. So, Don, it sounds a lot to me like you are truly a librarian of the undersea. Well, it's kind of funny because when I was a kid, I wanted to be a librarian. And I went to the local librarian when I was age six and I said, I, I want to be a librarian. Can I have a job? And she, of course, laughed me off and sent me on my way. And I, I had no idea I would end up being a sort of librarian in the end. <laughs> All right, there you go. I think this kind of being this kind of librarian sounds maybe pretty awesome. Yeah, I it's mean, you get awesome. to you get to go diving, and it sounds like you've got like a sort of dictionary-like understanding of all the animals found off of our coast. So, if we wanted myself in the audience here wanted to learn more about a particular animal, we could ask you. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to put it out to you, audience. Is there an animal that lives off the coast of BC, maybe along the bottom of the seafloor, that you'd be interested in learning a little bit more about? 
Any animal at all? Yes. Crabs. crabs. Is there a particular kind of crab you're interested in? Like hermit crabs. Like hermit crabs. What can you tell us about hermit crabs in BC, Donna? Uh, they're always on. There's some of them on every dive. There's some that are way more common than others. It's always a thrill when you see one that isn't one of the common ones. Um, I could search all of those hermits by species for you and give you 48 years of records on when they're found. And I could break it into months or years or years by months, and we could have a 50-foot spreadsheet. All right. <laughs> but so, we tone that down. All right. So, yeah, you're able to parse out what would be most important for researchers. Uh, if, say, our audience member here was a researcher studying a particular kind of hermit crab, you could give her all those things that she needs to know. Yeah. Oh, very yeah. impressive. So this sounds like a really valuable sort of resource to have to monitor different ocean environments. And we've been doing it here off the coast of BC, but of course, a very important part of Canada is Canada's Arctic. And well, is there any kind of Arctic library out there? I mean, it's a rather uh, complex underwater community. It's a critical ecosystem. It seems like we should have a library up there, do we? Yes, we do because I've started it. And <laughs> nice. I had a lot of fun because part of what I do is data mining. So all the information in the database is not just mine, it's from experts that I trust and I know that their identification is reliable. So those records go into the database as well and that's why it goes back to 1967. But it, uh, in the Arctic, I have been fortunate to data mine all the aquarium's records on when we've been there, what we've done, buy photographs and build a base to work from. And so that's been really fun. Uh, that does sound like it would be a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah, it is still building. We're not finished yet. I still have more historic data to put in next week. I've got some information coming in from Pond Inlet. And uh, I'm getting videotapes from other researchers up there who have shown me their videotape. And I'm able to get more information f um, to add to what I saw when I was up there. And that's just really exciting, the collaboration and working with other people. Nice. But yeah. I'm but to actually dive yourself in oh. the Arctic. Oh, I was starstruck. It's like, I'm in the Arctic Ocean. And then I had to work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, was it, how was it in terms of adjusting? I mean, I've done some cold water dives, but I can't imagine. Well, I was really afraid it was going to be really cold, but it wasn't too bad. And I wouldn't want to have a leak in my suit, but the cold water was, uh, it wasn't quite as bad as I thought it was going to be. So I was so mesmerized by where I was in the animals that I really didn't think about the cold too much. Uh, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, in fact, we have a question from the audience. Claire from, Clara from Vancouver wants to know, what was one of the most exciting discoveries for you in the Arctic on, on this dive? Oh, well, the first dive I did, I, because I'd built this, this base before I left, I had a pretty good idea what we had I knew what we had already seen in this area because we went up there and the uh, team went up in 2014. So I knew what was, was in the area. But soon after I got in the water, I saw the orange blob sponge. It's like, I know this is not on my list. We're already adding to the taxonomy. So it's like, okay, what else is here? And it was just really exciting to find the orange blob sponge. I'm not sure how <laughs> exciting that sounds to most of us, <laughs> but orange blob ah, sponge. Ah, but when I looked at the video from the Ocean Network Canada, I found three more orange blob sponges. So Ooh. it's a little bit more. So we upped the information already, and it's pretty cool to do that. Is that its like official name, orange well, blob sponge? Well, uh, at this point. <laughs> Was that? Did you get to name that? Have you named anything in the Arctic? Uh, well, we found something that we. We sort of debated the color on that one. So yes, we named it just because it doesn't have a name by anybody else yet. And then we found another animal called a tunicate and we know what they are, but we didn't know what the species was. And it looks like a leopard. So we just called it the leopard tunicate and that's how it will stay until we know more. <laughs> and about how So that's fun getting to name things. A leopard tunicate, how, about how large are they? They're, so they're kind of like a sea squirt, a soft-ish bodied animal. Yeah. Yeah, and about yeah. How, how big are they? Uh, well, they vary in size a lot with different species, but this one was quite large. It was almost fist size. And fist size is big for a tunicate? Uh, yes. Oh, all right. Cool. Good to know. So you've been finding some pretty interesting animals. What was one of the most... What was one of the coolest ones? Was it the tunicate and the orange blob, or was there well, anything else that was particularly cool? I thought I'd hit Pater with those two, but then we did a dive deeper, and we were looking for and found soft coral. And that was pretty exciting because 
Coral is well known in cold water, so that wasn't a surprise. But to find it so close to a populated area and just know in my mind that I was going to be able to go up and when we talked with the elders and the, and the community people that they have coral right here in their water, right outside their door, uh, it was just moving to be able to bring this information to them. In fact, I heard from other team members that you in particular did a fantastic job of engaging community members up there. What sort of things were you able to do with, the, with those northern communities? Well, we, 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 spent the, we were invited to the Elder's Palace. So we, the uh, Elder's Palace? Yes. It's a, we felt very privileged to go there. And they brought the, all the local people, the local children, and we showed videotape of what it was like underwater. We had live animals, and we let them touch them and talk to them about it. And we talked to them. We got to talk to them and find out who they were mm. as well. So it was, it was, it was really thrilling. So not only did you get to travel underwater, but you got to explore the Arctic through these different communities yes. and show, tell them a little bit more about what was in their backyard and learn what they had discovered about them. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting up there because here we take it for granted in our inner tidal. The kids can go turn over rocks and find worms and, and tunicates and things like that in there. But up there, the ice has scoured the shoreline and nothing can mm. grow. So the animals are subtital and so these kids have not seen this stuff before they don't see sea stars the way our kids see sea stars so it was that uh, must have been exciting it was exciting so and certainly uh, you did a number of dives up there you were able to add to your database so about yes. uh, make it a little bit more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. I imagine it's just to start, but how many entries does the Arctic database have so far? Well, it started with 56 from last year's trip, and 56. this year we put in 76, and averaging, like, and with the, considering the overlap as well, it turns out we have about 120 species in the Cambridge Bay area, and about um, 127 in all of the Arctic. All right, still quite different from the 8,000 we have in your <laughs> database for British Columbia. It looks that we've got a lot to learn and there's still so much to see, so I'm sure it will be very exciting as your team heads up to the Arctic and continues to build on that database and learn more from those Arctic communities. Uh, but of course, it's something that all of you here have been a part of, uh, so we really do thank you for joining us to learn a little bit more about what it's like to be an underwater librarian with taxonomist and diver Donna Gibbs here. But if you'd like to learn a little bit more about some of the other exciting things we do in the Arctic. I invite you to tune in for our next Northern Spotlight talk show program, which will be happening at 1230 Pacific Standard Time. And that will be with Anna Juarez, a marine mammal trainer who works closely with Arctic species such as belugas. But of course, there's lots of wonderful information about our team, about the North, on the Vancouver Aquarium website, vanaqua.org slash our North. Be sure to check it out. But thanks so much again, everyone. Thank you very much, Donna. It was welcome. exciting to travel up North with you. You're welcome. Have a fantastic rest of your day.